And Matthew, I, I first heard about you in an interview with Mark Zuckerberg. And obviously he was raving about your essays and I, I really agree. I read them and I really enjoyed them. And I think they put everything uh, happening in, in the, the tech space now is sort of into perspective. And uh, how busy has this made your, your schedule? <laughs> it's made my schedule quite busy. I think one of the amazing things about this topic is different entrepreneurs and technologists have been focusing on either producing the metaverse, a metaverse, or the enabling technologies required to support one for decades. Every five to 10 years, the term repopularizes. This time, it feels like a phase state change, much akin to the fact that mobile internet existed since 1991. I actually think that it first came to Norway before expanding throughout the rest of the world, but it wasn't really another 10, 15 years until the mobile era began in earnest. And that reflected the fact that technologies had to mature, most notably via the iPhone, touchscreens, app stores, and 3G. When I wrote my first series on the metaverse two and a half years ago, I never thought that we were on the cusp of this wonkish term becoming the centerpiece of modern technology competition. And here we are. Cool. Uh, and uh, how, how did you sort of end up in this position? How did you stumble into the metaverse? I've been familiar with the term and the concept at large for decades. As I mentioned, it, it's not a new idea. What's new is our ability to realize it. For me personally, the experience was very much crystallized in late 2018. I was spending a lot of time in Fortnite, and of course, Fortnite has three years later become central to that initiative. But you can really see, even as Epic started to find Fortnite's identity, started to experiment, was frankly struggling to produce enough content to manage the millions of people who were coming in. But you could tell that this was something different. It was evolving. It was starting to cross over intellectual property. It was appealing to people who had never played a video game before and attracting brand investment from the types of companies you would never have thought would pioneer. That change, which I experienced as a user with my friends, with my local community, and also through many of the brands that I love, Marvel and Star Wars, started to show to me that this was different. And so I started tugging on the various themes and strings and technologies, and that brought me to more and more investment, more and more attention, and then to start to publicize my own experimentational thinking. Okay. Great. So curiosity and uh, playfulness sort of mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure all of the people at this conference are sort of wondering about what is actually the metaverse and could you try to sort of define it for us so, so we can understand? It's a tough term to describe. And I think it's very frequent to hear criticisms that the inability to crisply define it, in fact, of the matter, the lack of consensus on that term undermines its legitimacy. And of course, technology doesn't work that way. You can go through the 90s and the 2000s, skeptics of the mobile internet, skeptics of the internet. In fact, Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, wrote a piece in 1998 called Why Most Economist Predictions Are Wrong, in which he specifically said that the internet would find that by 2005, it was no more disruptive than the fax machine specifically predicated upon the belief that Metcalfe's law was wrong, that the value of a network did not grow in proportion to the number of users because most people had nothing to say or do online. I say this because we know that that was wrong, but there was no technical definition of the internet in the 1990s that would have crisply disabused that perspective. There was no definition in the 1990s that would explain what life in 2021 is. Wall Street bets, YOLO options, Bored Apes Yacht Club, TikTok driving the Billboard 100. These are all of the sorts of consequences of underlying enabling technology that come from the internet but are not the internet. The internet is literally defined as the internet protocol suite, an internetworking standard, also known as TCP IP. That definition provides nothing. So with that context out of the way, that throat clearing, I'll tell you the way that I think about it. For decades now, online culture has been progressing in visual fidelity. In the 90s, we represented our identity through a username. We expressed ourselves through text. 
By the late 90s, we were expressing ourselves through some sound clips and some imagery, basic websites. Thus, we saw the rise of MySpace. Eventually, broadband improves until the point at which we can now have a photo-centric representation of our identity, a display picture, and you get Facebook. Soon thereafter, broadband enables successive high volumes of photos, so we get rich media such as YouTube. Thereafter, we get on-the-fly content creation, expressing your identity not in a box, not here's my profile, but here's my daily life, Instagram, TikTok, stories format. Now we are at the cusp of the next version, which is 3D representation and avatars. And so when I'm asked, do you really believe in the term of the metaverse, what the metaverse definition is, what Neil Stevenson said, I like to abstract that and say, I believe that in perpetuity, an ever-growing share of our time, our labor, our leisure, our spend, our wealth, our friendships, happiness, and socializing will take place in virtual worlds and simulations, much like those same attributes have persistently grown on the 2D internet and the internet at large. And uh, we have a lot of advertisers with us today. Uh, so can you tell us a bit more about how you think advertisers can take advantage of uh, sort of the metaverse in its in current uh, quite small state and, and also into the future for like planning for how to take advantage of these benefits? Sure. The most important thing to do is to acknowledge where the audience is and what that means for opportunity in brand differentiation and in particular in market share. When you look at a title like Roblox, it is nine. Uh, it has 70% of 9 to 12-year-olds in the UK, US, New Zealand, and Australia. We're looking at a dramatic shift in where young audiences are, akin to millennials spending more time watching YouTube than traditional TV. Now, we may see some progressive shift where some of that time reduces. It's more likely that that time sustains. We're talking about a generation that plays different, that interacts different, that experiences leisure or has leisure preferences that are very different. And so finding a way to reach those audiences, especially as they exit a demo that we usually don't market to, which is nine to 12 year olds, but start being 15, 16, 17 plus. The second thing that I'd highlight there is what we've learned about the opportunity for differentiation. In the early 2010s, a whole crop of new D 2 C brands emerged and their differentiation was not necessarily product, it was about how they reached and appealed to audiences. We had social era techniques such as search engine optimization or SEO. We had social referrals. That was when you joined Uber and it said, we'll give you $5 if you acquire a customer for us. You had social media identities. This is where many brands started to say, our Twitter account doesn't just exist to say something, it exists to express our identity differently. We had not just YouTube advertisements, but native ad integration. We started to tell stories through YouTubers and stories that reflected the social era rather than just what a product was. Now, in 2021, those techniques are not going to build you market share. No one is going to come up with the next D 2 C mattress brand or toothbrush company by saying, we're going to do SEO. We're going to have an identity online. That has saturated those differentiation opportunities have become table stakes. The new frontier is virtual worlds. And that brings me to this third element, which is how different it is. Over time, we have learned that the most impactful way to advertise a product is typically by telling a story or a brand story around it. We see that now with YouTubes, with commercials, with multi-channel ad campaigns. But when you get into a virtual world, you're talking about the absolute elevation of a story into craft. You need to create a place people want to go where the experience itself is compelling, often in lieu of a game game, and yet reiterates that brand premise. Three years ago, Nike's Air Jordan brand did a partnership with Fortnite in which they created a fast moving world where you ran through an urban environment competing through stunts and feats. In exchange, you could earn virtual goods, you could earn Nikes and Air Jordan apparel, but the whole design was both fun and differentiated, but fundamentally intertwined with a very brand ethos. Now, it's easy to say, let's go to virtual world, let's sell a thing, and that's where the audience is, but creating something that is authentically fun, that users will choose to do 
rather than just tolerate is going to be an enormous challenge. And also, like uh, in recent news, Facebook is uh, changing their name. They're hiring 10,000 people and they're spending $10 billion dollars on the metaverse. And can you tell us a bit more about why they're doing this and do you think it will work? So when you take a look over generations, every time there is a substantial platform shift in networking, i.e. the mainframe to the internet to the mobile internet, or in computing platforms, again, from mainframe to personal computing to smartphone, you see substantial changes in who leads. Often new entrants come to market. When you take a look at the operating system, you see that going from IBM to Windows to iOS and Android on the hardware level. You again saw the shift from IBM to companies like Compaq and Dell and Acer. Now we take a look at Samsung and Apple in smartphones. But we also see that at the services layer. Two particularly stagnant industries, telecommunications and payments, were dominated by legacy providers for decades. Then in the 1990s, we have this sudden emergence of Skype in communications, in PayPal, in mobile payments. Ten years later, we have disruption start again. WhatsApp, Slack, Snapchat, much larger than Skype, much more successful and capable. And then we see in payments, Venmo, Square, Shopify emerge as well. Now we're at this cusp of the proto-metaverse era. We see potential platform shifts in Roblox, Unity, and Unreal. We see in payments, obviously, cryptocurrencies. Now doing upwards of $150 billion in transaction processing per day. And in communications, we potentially see new services, Zoom, one could argue, but more importantly, Discord. And so when you take a look at large, why is Facebook interested? Why is any company interested? Well, if you're a giant, it means that the changes are likely so dramatic that you have the opportunity of being displaced. But even if you're a giant, you have the opportunity to grow, to gain market share, to do things that you could never do before. Facebook is such an interesting case study because if we take a look at the classic GAFM categorization, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft, these five giants at a trillion dollars or more Facebook is the only one that does not have a dominant scaled operating system. The lack of an operating system is a fundamental stymie to their business. They can't launch mobile gaming. They can't charge consumers directly. Everything is impeded by the choices and preference of the operating systems they ride on. And so for a company like Facebook, it's not just an opportunity for disruption. It's not just an opportunity for market share. It's an opportunity to extend their business in a way that is fundamentally unlocking. I think this is one of the reasons why we see such a focus on Oculus today. And, and also, I, I, uh, I read your uh, nine-part primer on the metaverse, and there was one quote that really stuck with me, and that was from Tim Sweeney of Epic Games, and, and that's the maker of Fortnite. And he said that uh, the metaverse is going to be far more pervasive and powerful than anything else. And if one central company gains control of this, they will become more powerful than any government and be a god on earth. So do you agree with the statement? And do you think one company can take control of the metaverse? It's a really fascinating question to start with. And I think that there are a few different points. NVIDIA's founder and CEO, Jensen Huang, has made the point before that he believes that the economy of the metaverse will exceed that of the physical world. Now, the World Bank estimates that the global economy last year was worth $87 trillion dollars. So to put this in perspective, he believes it's going to be larger than that. Today, we generally assume that the digital economy is between 15 and 20 percent of the global economy. Now, that may or may not be fanciful. It is difficult to imagine on what time horizon that would be the case. The Internet is largely attributed or given a birth date of 1983. And so we're nearly 40 years in. And of course, it's still a minority share, even if it's the majority driver. But in any respect, we're talking about an extraordinarily valuable transition. I think one of the reasons why Tim is so convicted on the significance of who wins is because we're talking about a shift where in the digital era, our identities are online, are conjoined to an online presence. But for the most part, smartphones and the internet are an extension of our lives. They are productivity enablers. We don't exist online. We're talking about a shift in which we do exist online where we're recreating the physical world and existence 
online. This means that individual platforms actually own the atoms of our virtual existence. They control not just our data, but who we are, what we do, our wealth, and so forth. And so that's why individuals have this concern about who runs it, how powerful are they, what's the relative degree of centralization and decentralization. I think those are all valid. When we're talking about how powerful one of these companies is and whether it's one or many, I remain an optimist. It was not obvious in the 70s or 80s, even after the Internet Protocol Suite, again, what we consider the birthplace of the Internet developed, it was not obvious that there was going to be an interoperable Internet. In fact, the consensus was there was going to be multiple different networking standards that fragmented information and businesses and geographies. They're called the protocol wars. This is when IBM had its own standard. It didn't interoperate. Others had their own standard. Eventually, the economic primitives plus government push from the U.S. drove us to a more open world in which we see decentralization. No one owns the web. You don't need permission from anyone to build a web page, to distribute a web page. And we recognize that as being an important outcome. Right now, it is easier to look at Roblox and Minecraft and see them as the future. I'm optimistic that we will act actually see more enabling technologies that keep this a shared experience. That does not mean, however, that in an open metaverse, in a open standards version of a virtual future, you won't have dominant vertical and horizontal platforms. We, of course, will. The internet is open, and yet the vast majority of time and spend is spent on five platforms. But that's a different point. 